Howdy folks, welcome to The Daily Coin. My name is Rory and today is Saturday, December the 17th, 2016. And it is my great honor and distinct pleasure to welcome back to the show uh, Mr. Dave Hodges, who is the proprietor of The Common Sense Show. And you can find all of Dave's great work at thecommonsenseshow.com. Dave, welcome back. Hey, it's great to be back, Roy. It's been far too long. It has been far too long, and I can assure you we're going to change that uh, going forward. I um, want to get into some of your recent writings, and you've been covering uh, the bid to steal the election from Trump. And give us a summary of what your thoughts on what is happening and why your research has determined what is happening. Well, I said very shortly after the election that uh, the Clintonistas were not done and that the globalists would be coming after Donald Trump with everything they could muster. Certainly Jill Stein was um, financed and was working on behalf of the Clinton people. And uh, this has fallen apart for her. Now we look at the Texas elector situation, and I don't know if you know what's going on down there, but they're in the middle of a purge. I interviewed Ken Clark, and they have to rid themselves of a couple of electors who have some improprieties against uh, Donald Trump. But this is a national perspective as well, too, because what we're seeing is that now 70 electors across the nation have demanded a CIA briefing. And I have real issue with that. Number one, the CIA is forbidden by federal law to engage in any domestic operations whatsoever. And secondly, when you look at the psyops of the headlines that have run regarding Russian hacking, which is now being the excuse used to steal the election, the headlines say Russians hack election. Now, if all you do is read the headline and go no further, you are automatically predisposed to think that there is proof that the Russians have stolen votes from Hillary Clinton and given it to Donald Trump. But when you open the article up, which 90% of the people don't, and scroll down, you'll see all they're talking about is basic propaganda. The Russians favor Trump because they think they can work with him. Obama has shown he's untrustworthy. That is the sum and substance of what they're claiming, but the headline is deceptive, and that's what most people read. And this is swaying the electors, and it's giving the electors who don't like Trump, who are truly globalists at heart, an excuse not to vote for Trump. And this Monday, December 19th, we are going to see the vote take place in the late afternoon, and it's going to be monumental in terms of what happens. But Rory, I'm telling you, even if Trump prevails, all the forces are lining up to show me, at least, that there's going to be a civil conflict. And Trump has anticipated, I wrote an article that aired on Saturday morning, uh, prior to uh, December 17th, prior to the December 19th vote by the Electoral College, in which I clearly laid out the, the notion that Trump knows what's coming. He appointed Mad Dog Mattis as his defense secretary, or he's a nominated him, I should say, and Mattis is George Patton reincarnated. Uh, he's not a defense secretary. He's a battlefield commander. And then you've got General Kelly, who fits in the same mold, although he's a little more polished than Mattis. He's still the same mindset. And the reason that Trump has appointed these two is to draw the military to Trump's side in the event of a conflict. Now, Obama has responded, Rory, by sending 4,000 Fort Carson combat troops to the Russian border, along with 1,600 tanks, and then the support personnel on a six-to-one ratio to support these combat troops would total somewhere between 24 to 40,000. That's a real sizable move, but I don't think it's just to provoke Russia, although I think there's a dual purpose here. I think it's also to remove the support that Trump is counting on in a civil conflict. How How would that be? I'm, I'm a little. Well, OK, well, we're, we're looking at you mentioned we were going to get into UX 16, Unconventional Warfare Exercise 16, which is Jade Helm 16. And that has been taking place now since the beginning of this year in four military bases in Texas. And they are practicing for rogue American military units 
who do not support the Obama administration, and they've gone guerrilla in support of the people. And they're actively rehearsing this with foreign troops and Arsof and some other American military troops as well. Clearly, the establishment is anticipating a bifurcation of the military. And I go back to uh, Trump's appointees, Madison Kelly. They're trying to draw the bulk of the military to Trump's side when, when side choosing becomes important. And I think side choosing is going to happen sometime between the Electoral College vote and the inauguration. We could find ourselves embroiled in a civil war in, as early as January. I, I have no trouble for seeing that eventuality, as tragic as that is. Yeah, I, I kind of see something happening soon after the inauguration. However it goes, if that if the Clinton crime family is able to pull it off somehow, or if Trump is, in fact, put into office. I mean, one side or the other is going to be up in arms. They're going to be upset and pissed off about their candidate not getting in. And they are both vehement on both sides about having their candidate in office. And I mean, we're, we've already seen that. And well, what's at stake here, Rory, for the globalists is their lifeblood. Yes. Their lifeblood is basically free trade agreements. It neutralizes national sovereignty that controls corporations to some degree. It enhances corporate profits because they can seek markets with the cheapest labor. It prohibits tariffs on reimportation of these goods that are manufactured outside the home country, like the United States. And so that maximizes profits. And Trump is threatening to put a 35% tax on all reimported products from corporations that have relocated overseas. Well, they've worked for this for 30 years. They're not just going to say, well, the people have spoken. We have to lay down and accept the rule of law. Right. We're, 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 they're going to listen. The left is going to do what they got to do to disrupt America. And Roy, I'm, I'm going to say this with all the sincerity I can muster. This isn't just going to be about George Soros thugs from Black Lives Matter or MoveOn.org creating controversy at the inauguration. I'm talking serious terrorist activities on our country up to the detonation of a nuclear bomb. There, nothing is outside what they'll do because the control of the world is their goal and this is the obstacle to their goal. I would agree. I know that they are, it seems like that there's a conflict in, within the deep state and there's been a couple of people to write about this recently and it, it just seems like that that there's something going on behind the scenes that is kind of ripping at the fabric of these criminals that we never hear about, but they're the ones that are pulling the strings. I mean, would you agree with that? Or how do you see that aspect of what we're seeing at this point? I think there's no question there is division within the new world order, as we like to call it. There's the old guard and there's the nouveau riche, the new money, if you will. This actually played out in the 2008 election when Obama represented the old guard, Standard Oil, Exxon Mobil, British Petroleum. And McCain comes along and he made the surprise appointment of Sarah Palin. That was no accident. McCain wanted to open up the North Shore Alaskan oil to places like D Dutch Shell, Citgo, and this actually brought in an international conglomerate, Venezuela, China, effectively what's become the BRIC nation since the 2008 election. And McCain was soundly defeated by the old guard. But this is where I first learned about this division that took place. If you notice, and I'll show you the symptom of this in the media, that Rupert Murdoch of News Corp, who owns Fox News, is the only network that even gives Trump a semblance of a fair shake in the media. And I don't think they do a real good job, but I mean, CNN is just blatant Soviet style propaganda, a la yes. Pravda. And the reason being is because I have reported on this before. I have it on very good authority inside the Trump camp that Trump reached a deal when Rupert Murdoch and his wife went to visit Trump and his wife at Trump's Scotland golf resort. And they reached a deal. 
North Shore Alaska Oil Open. Dutch Shell, big player. Rupert Murdoch becomes one of the richest oil men in the world. And it's a move being opposed by the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, and all of the old guard. And this theme is still playing out today. The 2008 election themes are very much a part of this. And this is why I'm telling you there is nothing that the New World Order will stop at to prevent Trump from becoming the president and enacting his populist policies. Okay. I I know they're they're trying desperately and doing whatever, saying whatever that they that needs to be said or done. I mean, and we see that playing out, like you said, on CNN and these other propaganda mouthpiece mouthpieces, these prostitute media just continually hammering, hammering, hammering that what you do and what I do and all of our associates do is is propaganda when in fact they are the propagandists that are pumping lies and deceit into the homes of the American people. And I want to look at uh, Hillary's side and it's no, no secret that Hillary has committed treason and various crimes against humanity, one of which is what happened in Benghazi. Trump has stated he will not go after her, claiming, quote, she's been through a lot. Do you hear or see his tune changing? And if so, wouldn't this place him in the crosshairs of the deep state, or is he already in the crosshairs? Oh, he's in the crosshairs times a thousand. Uh, he, this is the story as it went down and, and, and this is a confidential source, but it's someone who I regularly interact with, who has direct ties to the inner circle of Trump and at least the campaign inner circle of Trump. I'm not speaking the establishment he's putting together, but I'm talking about when he was running for office and what happened on election night. And the facts really bear this story out too. The uh, Clinton campaign, fearful of prosecution, reached out to Trump when it was clear that Trump was going to win the electoral vote and said, let's make a deal. We won't tie this election up with vote recounts and so forth and try to get it into the hands of the Supreme Court where we might be able to convince Justice Roberts to go with us and you'll lose five to three. What we'll do is we'll concede in exchange for a promise of immunity. And Podesta came out without Clinton, and everyone thought this was going to be the concession speech, and it wasn't. Podesta said, a lot of votes to count. We'll come back here tomorrow. We'll see what's what. And that was basically a message to Trump, hey, we'll tie this thing up forever. And shortly after that, they reached the accord. That's why within three days, when they taped the 60 Minutes interview with Donald Trump, he said, Hillary Clinton's been through a lot. I have no interest in going after the Clintons and so forth. But... That was before the recounts. This was before the attempted briberies of several electors of the Electoral College by Clinton forces such as George Soros. And the noise coming out of the Trump administration is Hillary better go to a country where there's no extradition. (laughs) Well, (laughs) is there such a place? Uh, Uh, Dubai. Well... And, and Clintons have put $2 billion there. Oh, well. They, they, I, they're, they're preparing to run there if they need to. And do you want to know where the $2 billion came from, Rory? I'm sure the My, my good friend, well, yes. And how they got it is just despicable. It's a crime against humanity. The Clinton Foundation obtained $2 billion in various sources of funding to help with Haitian relief. They didn't spend a dime. They put it into their own getaway package. Gary Haven, the producer of Amerigad and owner of Curves, affiliated with Jenny Craig, and I talked a lot up until about three weeks ago. He's embroiled in helping the Haitian people. He has spent tens of millions of his own dollars in this effort, and he has uncovered from the Haitian people, the Haitian government officials, how much money the Clinton Foundation actually stole. It's criminal, and it's a crime against humanity. Yes, I mean, it's that's pretty well known that they did steal quite a bit of uh, funds through the Haitian efforts for the uh, hurricane relief or the so-called hurricane relief and that they just swindled all of that money. 
I mean, these people are, they are just beyond despicable. I mean, I, I really hope that he, that he does go after her. I mean, she needs to be in prison, period. She needs Here, to here's be tried the, for treason is what she needs to be done. Well, I, I agree. Let's, let's, let's talk about Uranium One and you talk about exactly. the treason. You're, you're exactly right, Rory. And, and, the, and your listeners may not be aware of this, but the New York Times, not Dave Hodges, not Rory, the New York Times ran an article, and I believe it was April of 2015, in which they exposed that Uranium One is a Clinton Foundation front piece, basically a shell corporation designed to be a conduit to sell 20% of the uranium supply of the United States to Putin. Putin, in exchange, put the money into the Clinton Foundation, and these funds were commingled with the presidential campaign. Now, how many felonies did I just mention there? <laughs> Too many to count. <laughs> exactly. And, and this was the New York Times. Now, I wasn't satisfied with the Times because I know what liars they are. So I went and launched my own investigation. And I found this went as deep as the BLM and Obama ordering the BLM to go on to ranchers' lands like the Bundys and friends, and this is what led to a lot of the standoffs that we've seen, and steal precious minerals, including uranium, from these ranchers. I mean, right now, the Obama administration is nothing but a criminal enterprise that was facilitating the Clinton Foundation and facilitating Hillary's run for office. It's incredible. Yeah, it, it it finally came out, and it may have been uh, through your research, Dave, that that I learned about the uh, Bun the whole situation with the Bundy Ranch was in direct relation to the uranium and this deal that the Clintons had cut with Russia. And you had mentioned uh, civil war a minute ago, and. Can we avoid civil war at this point? And if not, why? And if so, can you share your thoughts on what could possibly be a trigger trigger event? That you know that is so wide open. It's <laughs> it, what I would say. You know, and I'm going to give you an answer, but I want to give a disclaimer first because this is pure speculation. Because these uh, events are so fluid right now, the precursor events that we're in the middle of are so fluid that you have to look at this like a series of dominoes, A falls, B falls, C falls, and you really have to look at the progressions of things. And you also have multiple plots to take out Trump. And I don't mean just assassination, although clearly that has to be one of them. But, you know, Trump, you know, just experienced a big setback without him even taking office yet when the Federal Reserve raised interest rates. The economy is so fragile right now, they can't absorb. People can't absorb this. This is going to kill the housing market recovery that was actually underway. And now they're talking about a second interest rate hike. Well, they would never have done such a thing. In fact, when they were supporting Clinton, the Federal Reserve and Janet Yellen said an interest rate hike would be irresponsible well, until Trump is elected, of course, and we want to bring him down. But, Rory, there is something else I want to throw into this, too. There, this plot to undo Trump and destroy the United States is multifaceted. I've been working uh, with Paul Preston, and I actually am giving myself too, credit, too much credit in expressing it that way. I've been following it and doing some of my own research, but Paul Preston's provided the bulk of the research. And what he has discovered from his uh, position as the host of Agenda 21 Radio is that California is embroiled in a plot to exit the United States, and they're not alone. We all know about the La Raza, Atzla, and eight states back to Mexico, you know, because of the Mexican War, crimes against humanity, and so forth and so on. All whites must exit, you know, all of Mecha and La Raza and all that racist material they were putting out in the last decade. But this has now gotten lakes. Jerry Brown wants to be El Presidente of California. And I hope you're sitting down if you've not heard this, Rory, and your listeners have not heard this because Paul has documented it and I've reported on it. What Paul has are insiders that have been at these meetings, attended by the Obama administration. And I want to say that as an overlay. People at the meeting include members of the cartels, the Mexican consulate, the Bank of China, the Sasakawa crime family from World War II that engineered the rape of Nanking, and now their descendants own Mitsubishi. They're at these meetings. 
George Soros's people have been at these meetings. And what they're talking about is a, is a concept called Cal Exit, which basically California exits the United States and becomes its own country under the control of the United Nations. The farmland, and we won't have time to develop this whole idea in this interview, but the farmland uh, that has been basically decimated is being bought up by investors such as Diane Feinstein's husband, Richard Bloom, and he's hanging on to it and reselling it to the Chinese. And when they get the weather modification over with in California and stop the drought, this is going to be prime farmland owned by the Chinese. This is why the Bank of China is involved. And then, the, of course, the Chinese have a huge military presence there at the inland ports of Sacramento, Stockton. You see, you see Rory, I could go on forever about Jeez. this, but let me give you the bottom line. Let me give you the bottom line of this whole thing. California is only the first piece of the puzzle to exit the United States. This, I think, really is going to happen. And Trump will have a choice if he gets into the presidency. Does he send the military in to California? And I will tell you what was discussed in front of Obama personnel, Obama administration people, because uh, Preston's um, source was there. We will start killing white people to force an exodus from California for the people who would oppose this. They also want to do away with blacks, and they're going to randomly start targeting these people if their move to leave the union is blocked. But this isn't the only one. We now look at Cascadia. What's that? Washington and Oregon. And this is separate and apart from Paul's work. This is my work. Washington and Oregon have been approached by the Canadian government to form a new province called Cascadia. And it's actually been in the Seattle Times. I was shocked it was mainstream media. And and I'm going to come back to something else that I have written about before. The Gulf Coast is going to have another incident. And the reason I say that is the funds and the mechanisms to evacuate the Gulf Coast have been put into motion. And they've been there for a long time. And they're moving forward. And they're under the control of the United Nations. This country is being ready to be broken apart. Uh, it doesn't surprise me. I know that there have been small uh, groups to form to secede from the country, but they're not along the scale of what you're talking about. I mean, these are these are small scale, a couple of counties here, four or five counties there, and... I know that there's at least four that are very active, and one, uh, the state of Jefferson, is on the yes, yes. Uh, California Oregon border. And uh, let, let me let me say something. Let me say something about the California Oregon situation with the state of Jefferson. Uh, Paul Preston, that's the area he lives in. He's right. an active participant in the state of Jefferson. This is a legal movement to create a 51st day. It's completely legal. They have a legal team involved. They can make it happen. But Cal Exit would uh, basically uh, take away that ability. Now, the reason Paul found out about all this is because this conflicted with the state of Jefferson's activities. And then Paul said, we need to look into this. And he's got extensive resources in that state. And he put those resources to work. Now, here's something very telling, Roy. Uh, Paul has been interviewed by me three times in the last four weeks uh, to cover what's going on. And each time Paul has told me, I've sent another communication to the governor's office for comment on Cal Exit, and they refuse comment. Well, in my book, that's a comment unto itself. Yes. Because if this stuff wasn't true, then all Brown would have to do is issue a statement of denial. That's it. You know, if you're... It's a lot easier to say something than to not say something. Exactly. Oh, man. And you had mentioned uh, Jade Helm and UX, and I want to touch on that based on everything that we've just been discussing because it seems like these two mass events are precursors to what the... Uh, Deep State, the globalist, New World Order, whatever you want to call them. I mean, was Jade Helm 15 and UX 16 in preparation for civil war? Or, Dave, was it for the purpose of creating a federal police force to begin disappearing or arresting 
dissenters like ourselves? Both. Okay. Yeah, both are prominent. I would say Jade Helm 15 leaned in the direction of the latter. With uh, Jade Helm 16, or what we call unconventional warfare exercise 16, what you're seeing now are foreign troops combining with U.S. soldiers in engaging in a mock guerrilla warfare set of activities. I received a communication and then a follow-up, and I believe this is sincere. I was told by what I presumed to be an officer, although he did not identify himself with anything other than military personnel, but I believe this was an officer, and you'll see why. He, he and his group were ordered, and other officers were ordered, to attend a demonstration conducted by the Russian Spetsnaz. And they were showing enhanced torture and interrogation techniques of a very severe nature. Let me just describe two of them. In one of these scenarios, they had 10 actors bound uh, to a chair and they were trying to extract information about guerrilla warfare movements. And when the, when the question wasn't answered, they'd give them a second chance. And if they didn't respond, they shot them in the back of the head and moved down the line. And then they told the American officers in attendance that you could expect if you have 10 like this, you'll have to get to number three or four until they'll start talking. But the second thing that they did is they brought in actors that pretended to be family members of someone who was bound to a chair and they were executing family members one at a time to extract information. Now, this is what the source told me. He said, this is nothing we didn't know. We didn't need to sit through this demonstration and see this ridiculousness. He said, we all know this happens. He said, they were looking at us. I'm sure we were being filmed. Every movement, every blink was analyzed to see if we would accept what was going on. And then he communicated with me this past week. And he said, the exercises, as far as he knows, is over. But he said, he knows from what he told me, that there were at least two other groups of officers that received the same demonstrations. And he said, I think they're developing a naughty and nice list. They want to be able to predict who's going to defect and who isn't. Well, that actually makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> I mean, yeah, it does. And as far as that aspect of it, Dave, I'm, this, we have most of our military offshore at this point. We also have the mercenary group, uh, Academy X, formerly known as Blackwater. How, how does that play out as far as what you were just talking about, as far as what we're talking about right now with Jade Helm, Civil War, the fact that our military probably will defend the citizens, in my opinion, I think they would defend the citizens, how do you see that playing out as far as Academy X's role versus the military being offshore, federal police being developed, all of this? What, what do they have a role or? Yes, they, they do. Okay. Absolutely. They do. Going back to what I, we started the interview with when I revealed that uh, 4,000 troops from Fort Carson and just the tip of the iceberg, I had been moved to uh, Eastern Europe near the Russian border in a provocative move. And I do think they would welcome a third world war, but I don't think Putin's going to react. He's, he's going to wait to see if Trump actually gets into office, right? Uh, which is his preference. I don't think they're going to be able to provoke him by poking the bear. But as you pointed out, the combat troops are overseas. Being in Afghanistan now makes no sense. We put more troops back into Iraq. That makes no sense. This makes no sense to provoke Putin in an interim period when it would become the next president's problem, except you're taking away Trump's potential allies. And I mentioned about General Mattis and General Kelly could draw a lot of these combat troops to them because they've commanded a lot of them. So as a consequence, a lot of Trump's military support base for a civil war is overseas now and has been negated. Now, you asked me about uh, the uh, mercenary arm of the establishment. And I don't have any specific information about them, but I will take you back about three to four years ago. And I'm sure you recall when DHS obtained 2,700 armored vehicles and 2.2 round billion rounds of, in, of ammunition. And we used to ask the question, who the heck are they going to fight? Well, they're not going to Afghanistan, so this must be meant for the American people. 
And clearly, this is what Obama is gearing up for. It's, it, that makes perfect sense. I mean, now we're probably seeing what all of that equipment was purchased for. And I want to make the point that the one point, I think it was 1.9 billion rounds, those were illegal, according to G Geneva Convention, illegal hollow point rounds. So these are, and it's enough ammunition to fight a war for 35 years. Yes. And more it, ammunition than I, than Iraq and Afghanistan put together. It's incredible. I mean, and I, I just don't. You're right. You're right. Uh, You're right about that. It, it's, it's, they are lining the chess pieces are being formed on the board of warfare, civil warfare as we speak. And there is no question this is what's going on. We, we, we talked about this three and four years ago when DHS was engaged in these activities. And we said, clearly, they're militarizing against the people. Do you remember yeah. that they came out with the paper targets being trained, yeah. uh, used to train DHS agents, and they can contain pictures of a white woman who was pregnant, an old guy, a child. Do you remember that? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I they remember were telling you. Well. They were telling you what they're going to do. I mean, they they transmitted that three years ago, and there's no question that we are looking at the fact that Obama has lined. Do you remember in in his campaign when Obama said first campaign? He said, "We need a national security force that's just as strong, just as well funded as our military." Well, I yes. just told you what that was. There you go. Hope and change. He certainly brought it to us. No hope. And lots of change. I mean, it's incredible. You have to wonder, just to show you how dumbed down we are, we elected a man who didn't complete one senatorial term and his only other job, real job he had in his life, if you can call this a job, was being a state senator for one term. And other than that, all he was was a community activist, in other words, antagonist. Man never did anything. We don't even know who he was, and yet we elected him. And now it's come out that his birth certificate is indeed a forgery or fake, however you want to look at it. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. Uh, Jor Pyle, and you're, you're quoting Jor Pyle here's recent press conference in the Phoenix area where I live. Joe uh, actually had this information years ago and it came yes. out. Uh, he had a, a postman he interviewed. And they took an affidavit from who was Bill Ayers' postman. And... Oh, do you hear that? Wow, we're getting interfered with. Um, well, anyway, I'll press on. But Bill Ayers uh, basically launched Obama's career, and uh, uh, it was o Obama that used to visit him all the time. He talked to this postman, Alan Hutton, and said, yeah, I'm going to be president, and I'm from Africa, and just all the damning stuff. So our piles had this for quite some time. Hello, Rory. What, what is that? I don't know. Hang on. Let me uh, go into my panel. I had... I cleared all my programs when we started. If you recall, I said, here, let me take off the uh, other stuff that's on here. And since we've been talking, I just went into one of my browsers and four programs have popped up. And now this isn't all that's <laughs> happened. I had, a, I had an article that I wrote three years ago that somebody somehow put on my website this last week. In addition, I put two videos up on the platform on unseen.is, which is the alternative to Facebook, and they stripped it. Someone stripped out the sound. Yet when you go back to my YouTube channel, the sound is fine. Huh. So I've been messed with pretty strongly. Of course, you know, I'm one of the people that the Washington Post has accused of being a Russian operative. Yes. Did you get your check? Did you get paid yet? No, Vladimir hasn't got around to paying me yet. You know, Man, what a, what a rat. <laughs> you, you know what's interesting, Rory, about this whole thing is I went and counted after the Washington Post made this ridiculous allegation, and then Congress has subsequently acted on it with um, legislation, you know, with H.R. 6393. And I went and counted. First of all, I had a well-publicized feud with the voice of Russia that tried to mischaracterize an interview I did with them, and I yes. blasted them, and I continued blasting them for a long time. And then I've written 17 articles of various types that are critical of Vladimir Putin. The man is ex-KGB, which means that when the Soviet Union fell, he became Russian mafia. He kills journalists. 
the man is a bad, bad guy. He used to beat his wife. And I'm not saying this for effect. I'm just telling you what I know. And I have published all these things. Uh, and, and the only thing I said positive about Putin, the only thing I've said is that he's a better leader for Russia than what we had in America with Obama because he's not a traitor to his own people as Obama is to his. Exactly. That's the closest to supporting Putin I've come. Yet the Washington Post irresponsibly reported that garbage. Well, they're, they are part of the deep state. Jeff Bezos, uh, Amazon owns Washington Post. I mean, they're, they're just a puppet. They're just, that's all they are. It's a prostitute mouthpiece for these criminals that are currently running our country. And I don't know yeah. what it's going to take, but we need to, we need to take our country back. I, that's what I know. No question. But you know what the New York Times tried to do to me, Rory? They contacted me, oh gosh, maybe six weeks ago, and they were so supremely confident in this interview I did with the New York Times that uh, they said to me, well, when Clinton wins, are you going to be part of a group that promotes a violent backlash against the administration? <laughs> and, and, I, and I told the guy right there, I said, do you understand that you're talking to me on my Skype number? And he goes, what does that mean? I said, I recorded every word of this conversation. So therefore, if you print one thing that I'm inciting violence, I said, I will sue your ass back to the Stone Age. There you go. He never, he never printed the article. I'm not surprised. That was, yeah, I sent him a copy of a the setup. file. <laughs> I, I sent him a copy of the file. I sent the, uh, uh, the uh, reporter's editor a copy of the file. And I said, you know, I, I hope you go forward this selfishly because it'll help my ratings. But I said, I promise you, I will sue you if you say anything along the lines of what you tried to get me to say that I wouldn't. Exactly. It's incredible. I mean, that, that's, that's a little thin right there. I mean, I could see him trying to get you to say something that you shouldn't under, you know, with in a different manner. But to just basically come out and say, hey, Dave. You in in favor of uh, violent uprising? <laughs> well, the way I answered oh, that question gosh. is that basically that's essentially what he asked me. And I said, if you come into my house and you're wearing a blue helmet, you're going to be going out in a body bag. And I said, if you're out in the street in front of my house and you're not shooting at me, you have nothing to worry about. But I told him, I said, the minute you cross the threshold of my door, and I perceive you to gaining illegal entry, I will use lethal force against you. Which is legal. It is legal, exactly. And I won't hesitate. Yeah, I will not hesitate whatsoever. I had a neighbor a couple of years ago, uh, some meth addict crashed through his bay window, and they found him at 3 a.m. in the living room. And the guy had a shotgun. And the guy, and the, the guy didn't have a shotgun. My neighbor had the shotgun, but the guy had a knife. And what was interesting is, and I asked him about this. I said, uh, he had a knife? Yeah. I says, I said, what would you have done, Dave? I said, I'd have blown his stinking head off. Yeah. People come into your house with bad intentions. They need to leave in body bags. Now, aside from that, everything that I propose from the Common Sense Show to my YouTube channel uh, from my presence on unseen.is, which is the Facebook alternative, everything I print and I say is about nonviolent change within the system. Yeah. But I will tell you, all bets are off when you come into my house with bad intentions. That's a whole different ballgame. Yes, it is. I agree wholeheartedly. Yeah. I'm, I'm still, I'm trying to find nonviolent solutions. I think that they do exist. I think that we need to work. I think we need to listen to the words of Dr. Martin Luther King. I mean, and John Lennon. I mean, John Lennon said, "As soon as you turn violent, they know how to they know how to deal with you. If exactly. you don't, if you're not violent, they don't know what to do. They they, they how, don't. I mean, that's how Gandhi won. Exactly. That's how. And, and uh, the, these great men that were great reformers, like King, like Gandhi, two of my favorite figures in history." showed that, you know, we're going to get our way because God's on our side because we're right. <laughs> and as long as we don't incorporate violence, you know, you guys are going to lose. And that's exactly what happened. And that's what I'm hoping we'll do here. See, I'm, what, what I'm really hopeful for, Rory, at the end of the day, 
is I, is I just don't want to be a rabble rouser that exposes, you know, all, all this bad intent on the part of very evil people, most of them who serve Satan. What I want to do is be part of a solution spiritually where people come to Christ and God re-bestows his blessing upon our country, because I think he's removed it. I think we're a nation under judgment, and rightly so. And I'm hopeful that this nation will turn to God, and as a consequence, God will protect his followers. And this is what I'm hopeful that will accomplish through these times. I noticed Donald Trump said uh, about a week ago he wants to restore prayer to the public schools. Amen, Donald. It's amazing how our country has morphed into this cesspool since God has been removed from everything and has been really just marginalized or completely eliminated from all aspects of life while all of the deviance of society has been given a a huge platform, we'll call it television, and being on display 24-7, that all of these deviant aspects of life, well, they're just normal. You know, that's just how life is. That's how people are. Well, not really. It's not how we are. It's not who we are. And whether you're a Christian or whatever faith, or no faith, at the end of the day, I can assure you, 99% of the people will find faith just before the lights are turned out. Yeah. And that's, so you can either find it now or you can find it at the last minute. But however that works out for you, the, the fact of the matter is, is that our country has changed dramatically since the removal of the spiritual aspects of our life have been marginalized or eliminated completely. Well, that's because the spiritual part of who we are is our best weapon. Exactly. You know, faith, faith can move mountains a lot quicker than howitzers. <laughs> and I, I think that, that when we look at the options that are available to us, First of all, if the people think they're going to rise up and overthrow the globalists, think again. Yeah. Uh, the military could do it, but do you really want to be embroiled in something like that where a lot of us are going to die as collateral damage? You know, the, the best solution is the spiritual solution, and that's what I pray for. God, please find a way to heal this nation uh, with a minimum loss of life and, and use your divine judgment in finding the best path possible for all parties. And this is, this is what I pray for daily, because I think this is our only way out of the woods. Now, on the other side of the coin, it is incumbent upon me uh, in doing my work that I do identify the problem areas, because there are people that are just lollygagging through life that think this is all a bunch of nonsense, and that nothing is wrong with the government, and Obama would never do what he's doing, and Clinton isn't guilty of any crimes. And I need to point it out, hey, there is a real war going on, and this goes deeper than globalists versus nationalists or left versus right. This is Christians versus Satanists. I mean, that to me is the bottom line. Uh, That is the bottom line. It is, we are in a spiritual warfare or a spiritual war. And right now it's, it's getting ugly. I mean, the, the, the Satanists are, they're winning. I hate to say it, but right now, they seem to be in charge, and it's not good. It's not healthy. And well, we know who the, we know who the prince of this world is, and but that's a temporary uh, coronation for him, for Satan, and it's um, it's going to be short lived. Unfortunately, as the Bible teaches us, we're probably not going to get out of this without a great deal of consternation and loss of life. Unfortunately. Well, Dave, I've taken up a lot of your time this morning. And I certainly appreciate all you've provided, all your knowledge and wisdom. And I look forward to uh, doing this again in the not too distant future. It won't be near as long as last time, I can assure you. (laughs) Okay, well, I'd be happy to come back anytime, Rory. All right, Dave, have a good morning. We've been speaking with uh, Dave Hodges from The Common Sense Show. 
and you can find all Dave's work at thecommonsenseshow.com. Dave, give them your address over at Unseen. How do we get you, well, how yeah, do we just, find you yeah, over there? This is so good because I think social media is really good for people, especially people trying to find out what's really going on. Facebook is awful. I mean, I, I won't go into all the things they do, but they're awful. Go to unseen.life, as S-E-E-N dot life is where you go. Unseen.is is our communication device, and you can sign up for email there that's totally encrypted, and it runs out of Iceland, and we don't think the NSA has learned to hack it yet. But seen.life is our Facebook equivalent, but we have no censorship. But there's no assassinate Donald Trump pages there. Uh, you can write about Hillary Clinton and not get banned. It, it's incredible what Facebook is doing now with their communist Chinese approach to censorship. And we don't have any of that over there. So we're growing like crazy. I'm, my, my site, The Common Sense Show, is growing between 75 to 100 people a day. Nice. And this has been over the last two weeks. And, and our membership is now approaching 200,000 people. So we're wow. starting to become a significant force. And Facebook is getting concerned. They should. And it's seen. seen. No, I'm sorry. It's seen.life. Yeah, S E N dot life. And they, people can also sign up for our email service at unseen dot is. I'm not affiliated with that. I am a spokesperson for seen dot life simply because I believe in it. It's social media outside the control of uh, the establishment. And, exactly. and really, that's the only one. I mean, if you look at Rory, what they're doing in YouTube. They're setting up the Heroes program where they're going to let yep. people as young as 13 go to sites and determine who stays in business. And then, of course, we've got Twitter threatening to ban Donald Trump. Well, they're going to ban a president. What do you think they're going to do to you? <laughs> and, and then, and then, of course, we got Facebook. <laughs> Facebook took away my groups two days ago. I don't even know if I can access them because I haven't been back on it. Uh, this kind of censorship is not present in Scene.Life, and this is why – I'm hopeful that people won't stop with scene.life. We need a new Twitter equivalent. We need a new equivalent to YouTube because we need to walk away from everything that's globalist. Yep. Now, uh, gab.ai uh, <coughs> is the Twitter alternative. And I joined that forum probably six months ago. I'm not as active as I should be. Um, uh, but that's going to change, and I'm definitely going to get on board with uh, Scene.Life and move away from Facebook because I'm sick of it. I am sick of these people just trying to dictate our lives. I mean, and that's what they're doing. And the only exactly. way to do it is just, like you said, walk away. And that's what Chris Duane has, has uh, said for a number of years. Don't participate. That's how you. That's how you beat them. I totally agree. That's good advice. I, I try to shop locally when I can. Uh, it's not always possible for all your products uh, choices, but I try to stay out of the corporate multinational free trade organizations that have robbed us of tens of millions of jobs. And I try to support my local economy with local business purchases. These are things that people can do. Trade and barter with your neighbors. Yep. You know, take away the power of the globalist by not participating. And that really fits in the mode of what we just talked about with Martin Luther King and Gandhi. Yep. Is that's what they did. Yes. It's exactly right. And also, I mean, you know, I'm all about gold and silver and people need to look at gold and silver for every dollar that you put into Precious metals, that's $1 less that's in the system that can be used for nefarious reasons, period. Every dollar that you put into gold and silver removes the equivalent from the system. That's the exactly. bottom line. Exactly right. The BRIC nations have figured that out, haven't they? Yep. Or yes, they have. Yes, they have. And they're doing it hand over fist as quickly as possible. So, well, all right, Dave, I'm not going to take up any more of your time. Uh, you've been very generous and I greatly, greatly appreciate it. And we will talk with you soon, my friend. Okay. My pleasure, Roy. Take care. You too.